Welcome to today's webinar event, which is a part of a three-part webinar series. Today's event is going to focus on companies that are looking to expand into the US, the tips, tricks, and pitfalls of US market entry. We have two other webinars that will occur later in the year. Session two will be on attracting global talent and structuring expat compensation packages. And session three will focus on preparing for stage two global growth or a business sale. So in the first session today, I'm going to take you through some initial considerations that you should be thinking about and in the early stages of your US market expansion. The first thing to remember is that the US is litigious. And I, I don't say that to scare you. I really like to advise my clients of this because there are things that you can do to protect yourself against getting sued in the US, or at least to ensure that you have some protection around it. So we have something called EPLI insurance in the US, just to give you an example of this. It's not something that we're typically used to in Australia because it's not something that's available, but here in the US we have litigation insurance. It's one of those things that I highly recommend companies obtain before they start operating here. We also have arbitration agreements to give you another example. So it's very common for employers um, to engage employees and have arbitration agreements and essentially that will prevent an employee from going straight to court if they want to sue you. Again, not something that we are typically used to in Australia, but it's another means available to employers here in the US to be able to protect yourself against litigation should the need arise. The other thing that I see um, companies doing frequently when they're looking to first expand into the US is trying to use Australian documents here in the US um, and thinking that just adapting them is going to be appropriate. The US is a very large place and even though in Australia we're the same size in land mass, it is a very different thing when we're doing business in the US and it's really important to recognize that early on. Firstly, because from a compliance perspective, it ends up being very expensive if you want to operate in across the whole of the US and also have employees potentially or even contractors across the US because the laws do differ significantly from state to state. And it's also important to understand that when you're looking at employing people and also in the documentation and the contracts that you're using in various states, because you certainly can't, unfortunately, adopt a one-size-fits-all approach in the US. It's very different to Australia in that um, you will need to obtain advice and different documentation for each state in which you, you choose to operate. There are many differences in the laws between Australia and the US and I just wanted to provide you with a couple of examples here um, just to demonstrate how different it can be employing people here in the US versus Australia. So in the US we have this concept of at-will employment which is obviously very foreign to an Australian employer because employees in Australia have so many protections around dismissal. It's not the case here in the US. Um, you certainly can employ people and terminate them at will. However, please be mindful of that because it certainly doesn't mean that you can terminate somebody for any reason here. The employees certainly still do have protections around things like discrimination. Um, so you do need to still make sure that you're complying with the laws that do apply but you don't have to give notice of termination. So that's just one, um, one difference here in employing people. Background checks are really common in the US um, and they're a really good tool that as an employer you can use to try and obtain some background information on your employees. So in Australia obviously we're very limited in the types of background checks that we are able to obtain um, due to privacy reasons and certainly there are some restrictions here in the US around that but it is a lot more um, you've got a great, a much greater ability to obtain background information on people here in the US. So I certainly recommend that that is a tool that you utilize when you're looking at recruitment strategy. 
restraints are also illegal in some states here in the US. So again, just another difference and something to really be mindful of because it can be a serious breach of some state laws to have restraints in employment documentation. Um, another reason why it's important to make sure that you don't use your Australian documents here in the US because obviously a lot of employers do utilise restraints in Australia um, and you could find that you end up getting sued and it can be very expensive litigation if you end up requiring somebody to enter into an employment agreement here in the US or even just an offer letter which contains a legal restraint provision. So just another reason why it's really important to get advice early on before you employ people here. Then there are also some state and even city specific laws that apply to employing people here in the US. So I mentioned um, just previously that the laws differ from state to state but they also differ from city to city in some instances as well. San Francisco for example is an example of a city that has um, city specific ordinances and so there's specific laws that apply to anybody that is employed in that city. So another reason why it's really important to get advice early on before you look to employ people in a particular location because it can obviously have a significant impact on your employment costs. One of the areas that I do a lot of work in advising my clients on is the transfer of employees between countries. And I find that it's the area that a lot of Australian businesses make mistakes in because it can be a really complex area. So I just want to take you through briefly some of the things that you should be thinking about if you are looking to either expand into the US and send some people here or just generally send some of your employees over to the US perhaps to scope out the market here. The first thing to keep in mind when you are transferring an employee from Australia to the US is that merely terminating employment or even merely transferring a person's employment to the US from Australia will not necessarily cut off Australian law from applying. There are certainly ways that that can be done but it does need to be done in a very careful manner because there is case law that provides that you cannot um, terminate employment in Australia merely to avoid Australian law from applying. So generally speaking what the law says is that if a person works for you in Australia and you transfer them overseas to work for you in a related entity then they will continue to be governed by Australian law. Now, they may also be governed by the laws in the country where they're working. So in this case, if you're transferring people from Australia to the US, certainly they will be subject to US law as well. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't need to also comply with Australian law. And it's really important to keep this in mind because I've seen a number of situations where employers have, have failed to recognise this and they've ended up getting sued by the employee when the relationship goes sour at some point and they've been sued in both countries which ultimately ends up in very expensive litigation. So it is really important before the person gets on the plane and actually relocates to think through what is this we're trying to achieve. Is this a temporary transfer? Is this a permanent transfer? Is this a transfer at the initiation of the employee's request? Is this a transfer because we want the individual to move to the US to help us grow our business there and what does that look like for the employment arrangement and also the laws that are going to apply to the individual whilst they're working abroad. Really important to document that carefully um, and in some cases an expat agreement will be needed which offset one country's entitlements against the other and then you'll also obviously need to think about things like does the, are you going to tax equalise the individual, are they going to have you know increased tax obligations, obligations under both countries. There will also be currency considerations if they're being paid in Australia or if they're being paid in the US in US currency. So they're all the types of things that should be worked out with the individual before they actually depart Australia. The other thing to note around that is what's going to happen to an employee's accrued local Australian benefits. 
Um, and again, that will come back to the type and nature of the ar arrangement that is being set up. So is it a permanent transfer? Is it a temporary transfer? Some benefits will not necessarily just be able to um, be paid out or terminated. Um, things like long service leave have different rules in each state. So it's important that you consider all of those types of matters before the individual um, is actually transferred and to make sure that it's clearly documented in the agreement with the individual employee. And lastly around that um, is also superannuation obligations. Again, even where you are able to successfully cut off any um, accrued local benefits, you may still have an ongoing super obligation in Australia. So really important to get advice on that early on as well. So I think it's fairly obvious, but for transfer situations, written contracts of employment are not just employment, they are absolutely essential if you want to avoid what could end up to be an extremely costly litigation process if the matter ends up resolving in a dispute. So really important to make sure that you document correctly the arrangement that's going to apply during the period of the transfer. One of the number one queries I get from companies who are looking to expand into the US is what fees or options are available for my employees if I want to transfer or even for myself if I am the individual who is going to be heading over to the US to try and build the US business. So now I want to take you through just very briefly the types of visa options that are available and I'm also going to talk a bit around um, what the new Trump administration potentially means for Aussie businesses looking to expand into the US in relation to immigration. There are five types of visas that are typically accessed by Australian companies looking to expand into the US or you know, to send people generally. The first one is the B1, B2 business visitor visa. And years ago, some of you may have heard about companies that would send people in on the B1, B2 um, business visitor visa frequently without any problem. Gone are those days, however. Things have certainly changed in the immigration landscape here in the US um, and they certainly can no longer be used for that purpose. I'll take you through in a moment um, just what they can be used for. We then have the E2 Trader Tradie Investor Visa and the E3 High Skilled Visa for Australian Professionals. Those two visas are part of the US-Australia Free Trade Agreement and again I'll take you through a little bit about how they can be utilised and also what the new administration potentially means for those two visa types. The other two visas that are not utilised as often as the other three that I've just mentioned are the L1 and that's the intercompany transfer visa for executives or managers and typically that's only used for individuals who don't qualify for one of the other visas um, and the reason really is because it's a lot more expensive visa application process and a lot more expensive. The other visa type is the H-1B specialty occupations visa and that's typically accessed if an individual either doesn't qualify for one of the other visas or wants to have um, immigrant visa rights which could potentially turn into a green card application. So the B-1, B-2 visa is only to be accessed for the purposes of coming over to the US to either um, go for a holiday or to attend business meetings. It's not intended to conduct work in the United States, to live here, um, you know, or for any purpose that would be considered to be running a business. Um, so because there is a very grey line here, they are getting harder to obtain and also even if you do obtain a B1, B2, that's certainly not the end of the story because again when you enter the US on a B1, B2 at border control you will be required to justify your entry under that visa type. It is getting harder so I, I know there are a lot of individuals who are starting to really get pulled up on these B1, B2 visas when they're entering multiple times a year 
you can't be seen to be living in the US or working here. Um, so it is, you know, starting to be a real issue for companies that do require multiple entries each year under this visa stream. It really does require now that you have um, evidence of the reasons why you're entering. Um, so if you're here for a conference or you're here to attend a meeting with a client, you may be required to show evidence of that meeting at the border. So essentially just be really careful if you are going to be entering on, under this visa stream um, and make sure that you're not entering on multiple occasions within a 12 month period. If you think that you will have a need to enter and exit a number of times within a short period, I strongly recommend you, you get advice around that to see whether there are um, other visa options that are more appropriate for you. The E2 Treaty Trader Investor Visa is um, a visa that requires a company to be able to demonstrate that it has made significant investment in the US. So there is no definition of what significant investment means, but generally what we say is that we like companies to be able to show at least $100,000 worth of investment into the US. And that certainly doesn't mean that we want to see $100,000 or at least $100,000 in a bank account. What we really need to be able to show um, for the purposes of the application is that the company's actually spent that amount of money building up their business here. So things like you know flights back and forward, uh, rent of an office space, um, employment costs, anything like that can be used to justify the investment in the US. Now if Qualify once approved, you, the good thing about this visa stream is that you can bring in a, an unlimited number of Australians um, who have management or supervisory or special skills um, from Australia to work in the US. They all must be Australian uh, nationals um, and each visa stamp is valid for a two year period and can be renewed. Um, so the benefit of the E2 Treaty Trader um, visa is that you can bring in an unlimited number of people once it has been approved. Uh, you can transfer existing employees but you can also bring in newly hired employees who are employed for the purposes of transferring to the US. So there's no requirement under the E2 that the individual has to have worked for you previously in Australia which is also other, another nice benefit of this visa type. The reason why I typically talk people out of the E2 is it's a lot more extensive visa application process. It's a lot more expensive um, than the E3. So unless you're intending to bring in a number of people, I don't generally recommend the E2. Um, certainly there is an option, but if you qualify for the E3, then the E3 has typically been a much easier, quicker process for companies. And in my experience, people always need visas, you know, yes, today so um, it's a good thing to keep in mind that you know with a lot of these applications they are expensive applications and they can take a considerable amount of time to process and then obtain a approval so it's a good idea to look at things like the E3 if it is an option for you because they generally are a lot easier to obtain than the E2. Now moving on to the E3. So the E3 is for high skilled Australians. It basically requires that the individual have a bachelor's degree or equivalent experience, which we generally say is a minimum of 12 years in the chosen profession or field. So the individual will need to be able to show that they have 12 years of experience in whatever job they're applying to perform for you in the US. Um, generally what we require are letters from previous employers if they don't have a bachelor's degree. But other than that, you know, that really is generally the only requirement and they're fairly easy applications to make um, and they generally take about four to eight weeks um, before the individual will have the visa in hand and ready to come to the US. Now, these two visa types, the E2 and E3, as I mentioned, are part of the US-Australia Free Trade Agreement. The problem with that, I guess, is that um, as we know, the Trump administration has 
generally said that they are not in favour of free trade agreements or some of the free trade agreements that are in place with countries. And so at the moment we don't have any idea about whether the Australia-US free trade agreement is going to be impacted in, in some respect at some point in the next four years. So I'm generally saying to clients that the E2E3 should not be seen as a long-term option. Certainly it's still around at the moment and is there to be accessed um, by companies if they are looking to expand. But if you have a situation where you think you're going to need to be in the US on a longer basis, then it's probably not the visa type to consider for a long term. The other thing about the E3 and E2 that we're starting to see is that the applications are being a lot more carefully scrutinised than what they used to be. So even going back 12 months ago, we would typically file an application and all that would be requested were really the passport, a resume, a position description and you know a couple of other matters. Now we're starting to see um, the Department of State request a lot more extensive documentation. So we've started to see applications where they want to look at the company structure, the shareholders, the officers and directors, those sort of details that were never typically asked for before. So it's really important to keep that in mind if you are a small business, a startup, a family business for example because you can't self-sponsor under any of these visa applications or these visa types. So if you are going to look to do one of these types of applications, you're going to have to make sure that your documents adequately uh, reflect the company arrangement that's in place so that it will comply with US um, immigration obligations. And what I mean by that is you generally can't have be the sole shareholder and director of your US company and then expect to be able to obtain one of these visas um, under that company structure. If you're the visa applicant, you can't therefore be the sole shareholder and director of the company. So another thing to really keep in mind when you're looking to initially set up your business in the US, it's really important that you have an immigration lawyer um, work with you to ensure that your structure is going to be appropriate if you do end up needing a visa under that structure. Just quickly, I'm going to touch on the L1 intercompany transfer visa. And as I mentioned, this really is a visa type that's available for individuals where they have worked for the related entity in Australia for at least 12 months. And generally because they are a much more expensive and timely application, I would only recommend that a company utilise the L1 visa if the individual doesn't for some reason qualify for the E3 visa. Um, so for instance, I have some clients who really need a manager or a, an individual who is a key employee in their business, for example a salesperson, um, to come over to the US and help them build um, their business over here. But for some reason they don't they either don't have a bachelor's degree or they don't have the twelve years of professional experience to be able to qualify. In those types of cases, we would then try for an L1 intercompany transfer. Um, significantly with the L1 though, you do have to have an actual office set up in the US, so you can't just use a you know a registered service office. Um, and you also do have to be able to show that the individual was supervising or managing people in Australia. So we've got to provide a, um, a company tree and also be able to show that the individual will be managing people here in the US as well. So we've also got to provide a, you know, an organisation chart for the US um, business as well. And lastly, just briefly on the H-1B. So this is a visa type that's very similar to the 457 that we have in Australia. And again, it's for high skilled workers here in the US. The reason why some people do elect to go under this H-1B visa stream is because it is an immigrant visa and that means that it can translate into a green card application if, um, if elected to do so. 
Um, the reason why it's not usually a viable option though for most people is that there is a cap on the visa types that are, of the visa numbers rather, that are available each year. They open on the 1st of April, the lottery, um, and then the, if you are successful in obtaining one of these visas, you can't start work until the 1st of October in that year. So for that reason, they're not really a viable option for most people when they're first looking to expand here. But there is no reason why uh, an employee couldn't perhaps move from an E3 to an H1B at some point in the future if you chose to have the individual remain in the US on a longer term basis. We are now just going to take a quick moment to read today's CLE code, which is AUS2225. Now just in summary, um, I'd like to just uh, recap what has been discussed today. The US is certainly an exciting market to expand into, and by no means do we want to discourage you from doing so, quite the opposite. But what I would like to leave you with today is that it is a very difficult market, so preparation is key. Making sure you get the right advice early is really important because even things like setting up the entity can have a significant impact down the track on matters such as immigration applications. So it's really important that you get the right advice, get it early, and plan appropriately because as you know, when you're expanding into a new market or doing any type of business anywhere globally, it takes a lot longer than what you anticipate. Now I'd like to hand it over to Peter Harper from CST Tax. Thank you. Thanks, Naomi. So firstly, I'd just like to thank Littler and the Queensland Government for uh, co-hosting this webinar with us. Uh, it is always uh, great to be involved in events like this with uh, great partners. Um, a little bit of background about myself. Uh, I'm the head of CST Tax Advisors in North America and a member of the global uh, executive of CST Tax. I'm a recognised specialist in the area of US Australia international tax. And a bit about CST, uh, we're a global chartered accounting and CPA firm that specialises in market entry and global mobility. Uh, so today uh, we're going to go on a bit of a journey. Firstly, we're going to look at what I call the building blocks of international tax. Uh, key concepts that any company that's expanding into a foreign market need to get their head around. Uh, then we're going to touch on a couple of uh, traps regarding uh, employees and uh, contractors um, and the importance of making sure you are, um, you're, you're across those rules. We'll then touch on um, choice of entity uh, and an overview of the uh, the check the box rules. Um, and then finally, uh, in the event that you're finding it hard to locate local talent um, to employ, if you are at that point where you're expanding into the US, um, some of the things you need to be aware of if you're sending Australian, Australian staff to the US. Okay. So today we're going to talk through um, the two fundamental concepts that govern uh, business and personal tax in both in the US and Australia, and they are the concepts of residence and source. Generally, if a company is a uh, resident of Australia or a resident of the US, they'll be taxed on a worldwide basis, and if they're a non-resident, they will only be taxed on locally sourced uh, income. So the easiest way to uh, explain this is through a through a practical example, a simple practical example. So if you think about an Australian company that owns New York real estate uh, and that real estate's being rented at a profit, um, the, uh, the income that's being derived is US sourced, so the state of New York and the US federal government are going to get primary taxing rights or sourcing taxing rights. Um, to the extent that tax is paid, uh, in Australia, you'll get a credit for the tax paid, and to the extent of any shortfall, you'll pay further tax in Australia. So if you think of those, the application of those principles and the flow of the way that the 
uh, rules work uh, from a technical perspective. Um, it, the first thing is, okay, what are the US domestic uh, rules relating to sourcing and how would they tax uh, the derivation of uh, New York sourced real estate? The next, the next step of the process is to look at the application of the US Australia Double Tra Tax Treaty to determine uh, whether um, that income uh, is somehow exempted from tax under the treaty. Um, in the when you take the the derivation of, of income from real estate, it's not. Um, so you would then simply flow through and say, okay, well, what are, what is the the application of the Australian rules because the company is an Australian resident company um, to the taxation of that income? Firstly. Um, under the Australian rules, they'd say, okay, what is the extent of any tax credit that should be extended for, to that income? Um, that would apply to both the, the federal tax and the state tax that's been paid. Um, and uh, it, if the, the rate of tax is not high enough, should there be further, further tax paid at an Australian level? Um, one thing that's important to note is that while... Um, while the Australian tax rules will grant a, a credit for a state for, for state income tax that's paid in the US, um, state income tax is not covered by the US Australia DTA. So there can be circumstances in which uh, income that is derived is not taxable at a federal level, but is taxable at a state level um, because the local rules uh, tax that particular form of income. Next up, I wanted to, to uh, touch on the concepts of a contractor employee, and I'll put this after the um, after the key concepts, but before the discussion on entity selection, because in my experience, uh, what we encounter on a regular basis is that you'll have an Australian company, Australian business, that is looking at US opportunities. Um, they might have people or executives coming in and out. Um, of the US uh, under the visa waiver program, um, you know they're they're actively looking for business, but they haven't determined yet that they want to want a full blown uh, US operation. And so the determination is made at some point where they say, look, we're not ready to, we don't want to uh, put an office down or employ people, but maybe we can we can set up a relationship with a subcontractor to undertake certain things on our behalf. Right, and in, and in this period, which which we see regularly, it's not uncommon for um, for the Australian parent to negotiate and secure um, secure deals with with US counterparties. So they're they're effectively earning income, which um, if they had what's called a permanent establishment, would they would be subject to US US tax. Um, so the, a couple of couple of Points that I just want to flag because I think this is this is this, this can be critical is that um, uh, Naomi has touched on the the difference between a subcontractor and an employee and the circumstances in which a subcontractor will be an employee. Um, the, there's similar rules that are that apply to um, uh, from a from a tax perspective um, and. and why that is relevant, there can be circumstances in which when you, where you have employed uh, or you have done a deal with a subcontractor to undertake work for you where you know bank accounts um, and uh, uh, mail and everything is going to their address. So they're doing all the things that you would want an employee to do. Um, and even though you don't have a physical office location, their, their, their home may be... Um, an office location for, for the business. Um, in that particular scenario, it's possible that um, because that person is, while you've, you've named them as a subcontractor, is, re is really an employee, and because they have um, a paid premises that's being used maybe exclusively for your business, that you have created a branch um, uh, at a federal level and that maybe you have some form of nexus um, to a particular state where that person's based. Um, and in the event of that, you, the outcome is that your Australian parent 
is now subject to um, US tax compliance and is liable for US tax, right? So in many, many situations, um, I mean, and also, it, 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 if, if the subcontractor is, is actually an employee, um, you've just exposed the Australian parent to um, local payroll tax and, and employee, uh, potential employee exposure. So in many cases, it is a lot simpler just to set up a, uh, a legal entity right out of the gate um, because it can save you, um, it can save you a lot of heartache in the long run. Okay. Next up, we'll look at choice of entity. So you've, you've, the journey is you've under, you got, you understood the key concepts. We've, we've talked about residence and source. We've talked about issues where you might have a subcontractor that is pulling you into the system. Um, you've taken that advice on board and you said, okay, Peter, well, we should just set up an entity right from the start so we can avoid those risks. Um, what I thought would be useful is for everyone to understand um, the, from a comparative perspective, the difference between the US entity selection system and that in Australia. So in, in the, the US does not have a imputation system, so a franking system that, that exists in Australia. Um, when they, when you look at corporate taxation, you've got, um, you've got tax that's levied at the corporate level and then you've got a lower to, to the extent that the shareholders are qualified. Um, you, you've got a lower rate of tax that, that's then levied on dividends that are paid out of corporations. But the rate, the overall rate of tax is still quite high compared to, um, to the Australian rules. So historically there were challenges with the way in which entities were classified. They were, they were either corporations or um, uh, they were uh, partnerships. And partnerships generally didn't have limited liability. Um, and the common law rules regarding partnerships were um, uh, were subject to a pretty loose interpretation. So it was determined that they would put in place um, the uh, check the box regulations, which is, is effectively a pick, pick your path uh, style um, uh, entity regime uh, where they basically said that there is a default classification for, for all the entities any entity that's going to be coming into the US tax system, there's a default classification and to the extent that entity is an eligible entity, they can choose an alternate classification by filing a particular form. So um, it, it, it is the case that if you had a, an LLC that was owned by one member, that is a sole proprietor. Um, it's a disregarded entity, but it's effectively taxed as a sole proprietor. Uh, if you have an LLC that has two members, it is taxed as a partnership. Um, and then there will be certain types of entities which you will just order, would ordinarily be classified as a per se corporation because of the structure of the entity. Um, and so then, therefore, if you fit into one of these three things and you are an eligible entity, you can choose to be taxed in another way. So the disregarded entity can be taxed as a corporation, the partnership can be taxed as a corporation, and the corporation can be taxed as either a partnership or a disregarded entity, depending on the, the share structure of the entity. So the, the corporate formalities of a operating entity in the US, provided that limited liability um, it exists, have become a lot less um, important. Um, and so uh, the key thing for um, for a uh, for an Australian company that is looking or an Australian business that's looking at, at, at trying to determine what entity to choose is to understand that one, there's no imputation system. So, um, to the extent you want to get a flow through of tax credits, um, you need to understand the re regime. And, and two, um, there are a bunch of policy mismatches between the two countries that can result in double tax. And again, the simplest way to show this is by way of an example. To the extent you had an Australian, let's let's consider a situation where you had an Australian company owned by an Australian trust and you have multiple beneficiaries of that trust, but effectively one that's going to receive the income, and then that the Australian company then invests and sets up a USC corporation. So you've got a US subsidiary, Australian parent owned by Australian trust. If 
the US subsidiary would earn a million, more than a million dollars of profit. And again, because I want to talk about flat rates, um, and we're assuming that the, so the corporate tax rate for that, for the, for the US sub was 40%. Uh, this is, this would how, this is how the income would flow if it flowed all the way back through to the underlying beneficiary in Australia. There'd be 40% tax at a corporate level. That'd be a combination of federal and state. There'd be a further 5% on the remaining 60% as the dividend flow to the Australian parent, um, that's been reduced from 30% to 5% under the US Australia double tax agreement. So we're, when, the, when that money then gets back to the Australian company, it's exempted from tax because of a particular exemption, which exempts uh, foreign source dividends of, of, uh, of subsidiaries. Um, and so you've got a situation where you've got uh, income that has not been subjected to any tax Right, because the 43% that came at, that was two levels of tax in the US is sitting in an Australian company that is exempt from tax. So you've got zero franking credits that are attached to essentially the remaining, the net 57 cents that's sitting in, or $57 that's sitting in, um, 57% that's sitting in your Australian company. If that dividend was to flow out to the individual beneficiary via the trust and that person was on the top marginal tax rate, their end rate of tax would be 70.93%, right? So um, tax choices matter on setup, uh, but it's not just about setting up the box. It's about understanding the economics, the economic flows of how you expect to derive income in your subsidiary and how you expect to repatriate profits um, back to Australia. And then again, the other thing that you need to keep in mind when you're setting up the entity is the objective to build a, build long-term value. So really you're trying to create a long-term passive income stream um, for your Australian business um, or is it something that you're focused on building up and selling? Um, so I've probably created a lot more questions and answers there, but I mean, I think the thing is, um, you know, the fundamental thing that I think that a lot of people uh, don't struggle to get their head around, particularly Australians, is is the way that the check the box, why the check the box rules are the way they are, and how they interact, and how they can be compared against the uh, the um, the Australian imputation system. And one other point, I suppose I'd make: if you're thinking about partnerships and disregarded entities, when I say flow through, I mean they're pretty much uh, conceptually the same as trusts, it, 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 loosely the same as trusts. When you think about them from a, from okay, well. Income can flow in and out of them without without entity, without an entity level of taxation. Um, so, okay, if we, again, we're going back to the journey that we've been going on. We have um, we have we started with an overview of some key concepts. We then talked about you know, risk of contract of, of surrounding contractors. We've touched on your choice of operating entity, and so now we're at a point in the um, See the life cycle of an expansionary company, where you've you've set up, you've realised that you've tried employing local people, and you've made the determination that we really need to send over some Australian folks to America because we we think we you know that'll give us a a better step up. So what I thought I would touch on is f from a mobility standpoint is. Um, uh, a quick summary of the US residency tax rules um, because remember way back at the start I talked about the concept of residence and source okay so from a personal perspective um, you know if an individual is a resident of the US they're taxed on a worldwide basis so that means you know, anything that they've left behind in Australia is going to be subject to tax now maybe that Australia still has primary or sourcing taxing rights on that income because it's you know real estate income or, or dividend income or whatever else, but you know the US will take the opposite position. Whereas you know to the extent of any shortfall, on from a credit perspective, there'll be further tax. And as I said right at the start, um, that the, any credits that are flowing through, they're federal tax credits, they're not state tax credits. So in any scenario where you've got an Australian moving to the US, you're going to have some degree of mismatch because you're going to have even if the federal credits match dollar for dollar. If they're in a, in a state where there's state income tax, they're going to have extra tax to pay. So uh, what are those rules? Um, the US is one of only two countries in the world that taxes, it taxes its citizens 
um, on on a worldwide basis. Um, so in in Australia, if you as soon as you cease to be a resident, you're only taxed in Australia on a on a on the basis of Australian sourced income. In the US, if you're a citizen, regardless of where you where you live in the world, you're taxed on a um, a worldwide basis. That the same go in in the context of US and Australia. That same rule applies to um, lawful permanent residents to green card holders. Um, and how that is implemented is every treaty, and this is particularly the case in the US Australia Treaty, there is this, what's called a savings clause, which effectively it says that the US can tax uh, its citizens and lawful permanent residents as though the treaty is not entered into force. So to the extent that they ever see a policy mismatch that they, they don't agree with or haven't agreed with, that provision allows them to pull stuff back into line um, within their own tax code. So... But the, the rules that are going to be most relevant to people that you're sending over is the substantial presence test. Um, and the substantial presence test, and this applies to non-immigrant aliens, so visa holders that aren't either a citizen or lawful permanent resident. Um, and it's actually a, a pretty nice test because in, in Australia, the way the residency rules work, they're very fact-based. Right? It's, it's heavily based on case law and common law, whereas the substantial... Let, uh, substantial presence test is a very clear formula um, and you're either a resident or you're not. And so the way that test works is that you, if we take, the con take an example of someone moving to the US in 2017, they would look at the amount of days they've spent in the US in 2017 times one plus the amount of days they've spent in the US in 2016 times one third plus the amount of days they've spent in the US in 2015 times one sixth. Add those day together if they were uh, at 183 or more, then they'd be a resident and subject to worldwide taxation. If they were less, then they'd be a non-resident and only taxable in the US on US sourced income. Um, I've flagged here on the slide the close connection test. It's probably not going to be relevant to um, any Australians listening uh, because of the application of the treaty, but there is a provision under the domestic tax rules um, to deal with folks that have moved, that are coming in and out of the US and that are from non-treaty countries. Um, it's a facts and circumstances test, which basically says that even if you are a resident by virtue of the substantial presence test, if you have a uh, close connection to another country and that can be proven on the basis of the facts and circumstances, then you um, then you can be a, a non-resident. But that that is a it can be a hard um, a hard thing to step over, so it's always, to the extent you're trying to be a non-resident of the US, it's best to um, focus on the substantial presence test. Um, and then finally, I've put a point here, um, I've, I've flagged a point here, treaty-based tax returns. The, the one thing is that, you know, I'll, I'll regularly come across people that have said, look, I'm yes, I've spent more than 183 days in the US on the substantial presence test, but I am a non-resident by virtue of the, the US-Australia Treaty, um, and they've made that determination and that choice without understanding what their US compliance obligations are. Um, I flag it simply because if you if you fall into this category, the way the the actual compliance works is you need to complete a return where you disclose your worldwide income, your worldwide assets, and then you back out your non US sourced income. So you know for for from an Austra for Australians that have you know, Australian trusts or companies or uh, in, or unit trusts, um, there's a huge compliance burden that goes into completing one of these returns. And they can be prohibitively, they can be prohib cost prohibitive. Um, so to the extent that, you know, I always say to clients, to the extent that you can stay out of this, uh, out of the treaty-based return um, by, by staying under the substantial pre presence test, you, you will save yourself... Um, considerable hassle and money. Okay. So that, that is the journey as far as the life cycle um, of business issues. Um, I've put here on my final slide just uh, key issues to consider for Australians moving to the US. Um, I'm not going to step into these in a whole lot of detail, but if you have any questions, because it's out of the scope of this presentation, but if you have any questions, feel free to, to um, touch on it. I mean, a couple of a couple of points that I just want to flag, I think are the most relevant is um, uh, 
basis, generally the U.S. will tax foreign assets on the on the on a historical basis. So uh, if a, if an Australian moves to the U.S. and they have cost basis in real estate, um, uh, the, they think um, they think will not be subject to, or, or there, there's a gain that's accrued prior to them arriving. So there's a gain that's accrued, unrealised gain that's accrued on a on an asset that's an Australian-based asset prior to arriving in the U.S. The way the U.S. tax rules is, if you sell an asset while you're U.S. tax resident, right? As I said before, you tax on a worldwide basis. That 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 gain, that unrealized gain that's effectively accrued prior to you becoming a resident, can be taxable. And what can make that even worse is that it's 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 that's determined on the basis of whether that's determined on a U.S. dollar basis. So if you bought it bought an asset when the currency was really depressed, and you're selling when the currency is um, rallied. Not only do you have the uh, the tax on the asset um, that's accrued, the, the gain that's accrued prior to you arriving, but you've also got foreign currency exposure. Um, and then just one other point is that the you know the Australian Australian taxation of real estate of of Australian taxation of non-residents uh, in 2012, the general discount was abolished for non-residents. So uh, in in a lot of cases these days. Um, selling assets, cert- selling certain assets, um, while Australian-based assets, while someone's a non-resident, can be cost prohibitive. So it's just important that you um, check the tax treat- treatment of assets post departure. Okay, and that's it for me. Uh, so that that includes the tax component of this um, presentation. I hope you've uh, Everyone uh, got a lot out of that, and I'd not now like to uh, pass over to uh, David Camelango. Thanks very much, Peter. My name is David Camelango, and I'm the Trade and Investment Commissioner to North America for the Queensland Government. Our agency is Trade and Investment Queensland, uh, and I'm based here in Houston, Texas, covering US, Canada, and Mexico from our office in Houston. Firstly, I'd like to thank Naomi and the team at Little R for putting on this webinar. I think it's very valuable and important for Australian companies to talk to people in the market uh, to gain a little bit of an understanding of considerations for their US entry. A uh, little bit of background on myself. I've been based in the US since 2002, so 15 years, 10 years in the private sector, working for a Queensland-based company to help set up their US presence and uh, was running the company uh, as a president of the company for some time uh, and was successful in growing that operation. And then the last five years, I've been with Trade and Investment Queensland supporting a number of other Queensland-based companies with their US entry across a wide variety of industries and a broad spectrum of companies ranging from early stage, uh, even startups, right through to large corporates and multinationals from Queensland. And so uh, hopefully I'll be able to impart a little bit of my uh, knowledge and experiences both in the private sector and with Trade Investment Queensland with you all here today. So a little bit of background on Trade and Investment Queensland. We are the Queensland Government's uh, global business agency, so we're the international arm of the Queensland Government. Uh, and our remit is really to support Queensland companies and exporters uh, succeed in international markets and hopefully help them enter new markets as well. We are also responsible, so that's the trade side, we're also responsible on the investment side in promoting Queensland as a destination for investment and that can be supporting foreign companies with their corporate expansion in the Australian market, hopefully into Queensland, and uh, even with uh, capital investment into Queensland and facilitating some of that work as well. So we have 15 offices all around the world. Um, we work very closely with the federal government and our with the kind of support that we can provide to Queensland companies is education, so doing webinars such as this, um, facilitation, so facilitating into referrals, helping them find potential partners in the market, uh, helping them understand the market and provide some insight into the opportunities, and then also a, a little bit of guidance and counselling with regards to their business plan for the market. So, you know, obviously the company's business plans will vary um, quite diversely depending on the market they're trying to enter, so hopefully we, we can provide a little bit of guidance um, with respect to that. <laughs> 
So whenever I'm asked to do some of these webinars, it's always tough to try and how do you distill everything that we do and everything that we learn and, and the considerations for entering a, a particular market, particularly our market, you know, the US market, into such a short time frame. And it's extremely difficult because it varies depending on the type of company, the type of offering, the type of product. Uh, in, and there's so many elements to your strategy for your US market entry. So I've taken a little bit of a different approach in this webinar, and that is I've just highlighted some of the common misperceptions, some of the myths, some of the pitfalls that I've seen uh, personally through my own experience, and also I've seen other companies that's occurred with other companies. So hopefully I can go through some of these uh, misconceptions and hopefully um, provide you with some insight to, to be able to avoid some of these pitfalls when you're developing your strategy for coming into the US market. So uh, word of warning, I, I may have embellished some of these quotes for dramatic effect. Uh, these are not necessarily uh, direct quotes, but it's more just to show some of the mindset that companies might have when they're coming into the market that uh, quickly changes after some time um, talking to people and developing their strategy. And so one of them is this one here. We have an incredible product. We just need to meet with customers. So this is the view that the product is the most critical portion of your US market strategy. And the reality is that great products can fail and poor products, I've seen poor products being very successful and it's all dependent upon the holistic market entry strategy. So the product is just one element. The key takeaway here is the product is just one element of the entire strategy. Uh, don't get me wrong, you need to have a clearly differentiated uh, product. And when we say product, I'm talking about an offering. If you have a service or a technology or another solution, it's not just a physical product. Um, so don't get me wrong, you need to have a very clear value proposition and a clear differentiation for your product. Um, but your features and the benefits to the end user of your product is just one uh, relatively small element of the holistic strategy for the US market. And I think it's important for Australian companies coming into the market to consider all factors. So that includes um, understanding the regulatory landscape, uh, importation, logistics, if it's a physical product, customs clearance, uh, the distribution, where are you going to warehouse your product, how are you going to, get, how are you going to fulfill those orders, uh, marketing, obviously very critical, demand generation, sales fulfillment, and then one of the more critical areas that's quite often forgotten is after sales service and support. So service and support before, during, and after the sales process. So final takeaway is product is important, but it is just one element that's required in the holistic strategy for entering the US market. So myth number two, or misconception number two. A product sells very well in Australia, which means it should do well in the USA. The truth is, Quite often, and I would probably estimate it's over 90% of the time in terms of the companies that we've seen come into the US market, that they've had to develop a specific and often differentiated value proposition for the US market compared to what they have for the Australian market. And that really is just, we speak the same language here in the US, but quite often the, the landscape, the buying decision, the buying conditions, market conditions, regular, regulatory conditions, um, economic conditions, all of these other conditions lend to a, a different environment for your buyer, for your end customer. And as a result, the value proposition needs to be different, quite often needs to be different. And I'll give an example. We have, we've worked with one particular company that has a great solution. Uh, it's a wastewater treatment technology servicing the industrial space. And uh, I think when they first came into the market, their, their value proposition in Australia was really centered around the environmental benefits that their solution delivered to um, the sector they were servicing, which was uh, the energy sector, oil and gas sector. The, and this, this was really centered around the regulatory requirements. So there's legislation that had restricted um, and made it quite difficult for some of these operators to, to do business, and so they've come up with a solution that made it easier for them to meet their regulatory requirements. Well, in the US, the regulatory requirements are vastly different and probably not as restrictive um, and, uh, and arguably, yeah, arguably restrictive and not quite as constrained as in Australia. And so as a result, their customers in the US or potential customers in the US didn't see as big 
a need and an urgency for uh, implementing a solution that provided these environmental benefits. However, the solution did also offer economic benefits, so financial benefits to the to the consumer, to the customer. Sorry, not the consumer, to the customer. And so it was a change in terms of the pitch and change change in terms of the value proposition to be centered around the economic benefits that their solution could bring to the customer, which definitely existed. But it also checked the environmental box as well, which is always a positive in the US. So just a case in point in terms of tweaking and adapting your value proposition to suit the US market, because quite often it needs to be different. So a trade and investment in Queensland, this, this misconception here is probably the most common one that I see on a day-to-day -day basis. And that is, we see companies, predominantly manufacturers that have a physical product, um, but sometimes services and technology companies as well, that are just searching for a distributor, and I use inverted commas, I'm using air quotes right now, a distributor to take their product to the market. The definition of the term distributor in the US is quite different, I think, to the perception of a lot of Australian companies. Australian companies view a distributor that are new to the market anyway, they view a distributor as somebody that will take the risk on bringing their product in the US market. And that is they will purchase product from the Australian supplier or manufacturer, bring the product into the market, they'll warehouse it, they'll inventory it, they'll manage the regulatory requirements, they will create demand for it, they have salespeople out there, they work with it, it's a retail product, if it's going to a retailer um, or if it's going direct to consumer, they will fulfill, you know, support the fulfillment of it, they'll create, they'll provide the service and the after service delivery. This is an absolute myth. Um, very, very, very rare that you would find somebody or an entity, and I'm not going to call them a distributor, but an entity that would take all of those risks. In the US, the, a distributor in the, two, in the true sense of the word tends to be almost glorified logistics companies. They take a product that you've created demand for. Sometimes you're already having to warehouse it yourself. Sometimes they won't even warehouse the product because it's too risky until there's some type of um, historical data in terms of the demand for it. Then they might carry the product. And they will just fulfill it to wherever the individual order is going to. So whether it's a consumer or whether it's on a retail shelf. And that's all that they do trying to find somebody that will take all of the risk and all of the other things that we talked about is is really going to fall back onto you, the manufacturer, and to you, the vendor, to you, the Australian company. And so the solution is you really need to develop the whole business plan, talking about all the things we, we discussed earlier around bringing your product in the market, regulatory compliance, and then creating demand as well because a distributor – Often distributors are carrying thousands, if not tens of thousands of products, and their sales reps uh, are really not trained in all of those products to be able to go out and promote them. So a distributor, even if you did happen to get it into a distributor, in the true sense of the word here in the US, that doesn't mean that that product will move at all. Um, and so it all falls back. What we find in the US, quite different to some other markets, is end, end customers, uh, retailers, and even distributors will put a lot of the requirements and a lot of the risk back onto the supplier. Um, and so I think that's it's a really important delineation and differentiation between the Australian market and the US market. So this next point is really a follow-on from the last point, and that is the ability to service the US market from Australia, even if you do find a distributor. And the reality is, as I just, as I just mentioned, distributors don't create demand for you, and distributors really don't provide much in the sense of on-the-ground support and after-sales service. They might have some customer service, they might have be able to manage warranties, uh, but a lot of that support needs to be provided locally, and a distributor will be looking for local on-the-ground support. And so the solution is, from different ends of the spectrum, is you can either employ staff locally, which is obviously very costly, but the more common approach for new companies coming into the market is to appoint a local sales agent or a local broker. If it's a food and beverage product, there's, there's food brokers that are out there that are the middlemen, so they're an intermediary. If it's a manufactured product, there might be manufacturer's reps. Other products, they might have sales agents. Um, and they're normally individuals or companies 
that represent a handful of manufacturers, perhaps um, five up to you know thirty even perhaps um, for larger larger brokers, and uh, predominantly commission based. They might have some type of retainer basis, predominantly commission based, but it's a relatively or it's a relatively inexpensive or less expensive uh, approach to having presence in the U.S. market. But you'll find that most retailers and even most distributors will not even consider doing business with you if you do not have that local presence on the ground. It doesn't have to be direct employee staff. It can be a broker, but they're expecting you to have local presence on the ground in the US. Myth number five, there is no direct competitor for our offering in the US. Uh, and I'm sure you guys have all heard this previously. This is not just common to Australia, I'm sure, uh, to the US. I'm sure you hear this in Australia as well. Uh, and that is companies that assume that there are no competitors for what they have to offer. They have something so unique that there's no com competitors or no, no competition. Um, you will get last out the door if you were to say that in the US. <laughs> there's always competitors for your offering. If it's a product, if it's a technology, uh, if it's some type of other solution, if it's a service, uh, there are always competitors and even probably more importantly is there's always substitutes for your offering. And so the, the challenge is getting your customer to move away from either from their current solution, which could just be a substitute, not, may not be a direct competitor, to your solution and open their checkbooks to be able to do that. And so the key is really understanding, taking the time to understand the competitive landscape, including substitutes for your solution. So as an example, uh, an, an example would be a software that manages rostering of staff. Well, there might be many other softwares out there, or there may not be any, but a direct substitute is Microsoft Excel. It might be pen and paper, it might be a whiteboard. So how are you going to get them to move away from the way that they're currently doing that, you know, even if it is just a whiteboard, to pay to use your software to, to roster staff? Just an example, but that, that, that's, I think you really, really need to have that type of mindset when you're going into talking to people because um, quite often customers are happy with the way that they're doing things. Quite often they're not, but quite often they are. And so you need to really articulate um, how you differentiate from other competitors, but also what's important to the buyer and positioning your offering to align with what's important to that buyer and, and hopefully really solving the problem and showing the benefits of them solving that problem as well. So, so make sure that you don't, you know, you don't assume that there are no competitors. Take the time to evaluate who your competitors are. Take the time to understand your customers and how they're currently solving this particular problem or what their solution is currently and positioning yourselves accordingly. Myth number six, and I'm sure we've all heard this one too, and that is the market for our product is X billion dollars, and I've just put X in there, and we only need 1% of the market. So, hey, this is a $20 billion market. If we get 1% of the market, that's $200 million. It's fantastic, right? We hear this all the time. We hear this all the time. And I think that's great if you're pitching to an investor who wants to see an incredibly large, totally addressable market. But you're kidding yourself um, if that's your approach to the market. And, and the reality is, if the market is that big, it's going to be extremely saturated. There's going to be a large number of other competitors out there and, and large significant incumbents out there. And so trying to take a portion of that big market is going to be extremely difficult, I think you'll find. And the key to it is, is really trying to segment that market down. So I've got in here the solution, segment, segment, segment. So sure, the market is $20 billion, but where are you going to play in that $20 million billion market? It's really trying to identify and, and drill down to this, probably the smallest segment that's reasonably possible for you to own that segment of the market. And that could be segmented by, really should be segmented by the customer needs. So is your solution servicing a particular industry within that market? Is it servicing a particular type of customer within that industry? Uh, and is it within a particular region, perhaps? Um, is there some type of demographics if, if it's a consumer product? So it's trying to segment that big market down. The big market is always nice. It looks great in your pitch presentations when you're talking to investors and so forth. Um, but but when, you've, when you've only got limited funding and you've only got limited resources to approach a market as big as the U.S. market, if you do not segment that market down into a small uh, and manageable piece, then you're going to fail because your your resources and your funding and your time is not going to be targeted. 
So key takeaway, segment it to a, to a manageable piece and, um, and then really try to own that market and then grow from there. So myth number seven, and that is the US market can generate a relatively quick additional cash flow. And the reality is I haven't had many people actually say this, uh, so I have embellished this a little bit, but this is really just trying to reinforce the point that the US market is a long-term investment. It is going to be, not, not can, I've got it can be, but it is going to be a drain on your cash flow for some period of time, possibly 12 to 24 months, sometimes longer, because it takes that type of time to, to launch into the US market, to build up your credibility, to build up your customer base. Um, you've got to have people on the ground, as we talked about earlier. Um, you've got to be able to create demand for your product and your service and your offering. That's going to cost money as well. How are you going to service them? That's going to cost money. So we, we do get some companies that look to the US as, hey, you know, if I can just get into the US market, I can get a small piece of that market and it'll generate a, some additional cash flow for me. Couldn't be further from the truth. So if you're not ready to fund your US market entry, then you're not ready for the US market. You, you really need to allocate sufficient funding during the launch of your market entry. Uh, Downstream, the benefits can be fantastic, obviously significant volumes uh, here in the US, but it takes some time to get to that level. So key takeaway, ensure you're allocating sufficient funding for the launch of your US market, allocating sufficient time, again, 12 to 24 months. And uh, if you can't allocate that funding, then I would say defer it until you can, in fact, do that. And our final myth or misconception, number eight, is we don't need service providers in the US because we can evaluate our own needs. And this is probably a good segue into this webinar in terms of the support that CST Tax Advisors and Little Arrow, of course, who's hosting, so kind of hosts and put forward this webinar, can provide. The truth is the US market is incredibly, incredibly complex from a regulatory landscape, from a legal landscape, from a taxation landscape, from an immigration landscape, banking, uh, it's almost intentionally complex, um, but it is very complex. And each jurisdiction, so every state and even sometimes municipalities and cities can have different laws. Um, labor laws, of course, uh, can be vastly different from state to state. And, and I think, you know, I, I actually use the analogy of the difference between Australia and the US. Australia, we're very much generalist, so we think we can do everything ourselves. So we bring everything in-house, we can do everything ourselves. In the US, there's a dependence and there's almost a need for specialists that really understand their body of work and their scope of work and it's to understand it very well and it's almost essential because nobody else can understand it unless you're so intricately involved in it. And I use the analogy of our football team. So um, our rugby teams in Australia have much smaller number of personnel on the teams in the teams. Um, that are very generous, they pass, they kick, they tackle, they're on offense, they're on defense. An American football team has something like 45, you know, 50, many more people on their, on their roster, um, and that's because they're specialists. And it's the same analogy, that analogy can be used in business as well. And I think companies can get into trouble where they don't take counsel early. And I think the, the really biggest piece of advice I can give companies is take the time up front to plan what you are intending to do in the US market, and then get some counsel and advice from professionals, from taxation specialists, from employment and labor law specialists, from legal specialists, in terms of your planning approach, because that little bit of cost up front can save you a heck of a lot of time and potential liability, and definitely cost, uh, later, down, later down the line. And I speak from experience here. Um, even IP protection and trademark laws and copyright, et cetera, those types of things. They're extremely complex, and um, and I think just knowing what you're in, intending on doing, what your presence is intending on doing, uh, and where you're in, expecting to go in the next few years, two years, five years, and even ten years, sort of mapping that out, and then having that conversation with a legal advisor and other professional, uh, taxation advisors and others, uh, is really really important. And so look, that uh, that concludes our webinar. And I think we're going to end up for some questions now. And I'd just, again, like to thank Littler for allowing me the opportunity to impart some of our, my um, experience and scars with the audience. And I uh, look forward to hearing from all of you and questions. Thanks very much.
Hello everyone, it's Naomi Seddon here. I hope you've enjoyed our webinar. Um, we did have one question that just um, recently came in, but if anyone does have any additional questions, feel free to either shoot them um, into the chat box, or you can also email Peter or I certainly after um, the webinar as well. So just to answer one of the questions that did come in, um, and that was which date is the best to set up in? And so I'll let Peter just um, chat briefly about that. Okay, thanks Naomi. Um, so the question regarding which state is best to set up in, um, it's a great question. Um, people often pose the question thinking um, that the real issue is around income tax. Uh, one thing I should, should flag, I don't know whether I addressed it in my presentation, is the US has both um, federal and state income tax whereas Australia just has a federal level of income tax. And certain states within the US are tax free. So some states have a zero rate of income tax and others have you know, upwards of 10% as a rate of income tax. So you, if you're online, you may read different things that are saying, hey, you should set up in this particular state because it's tax free. The thing to keep in mind is that the US state-based tax regime is similar in concept to international tax. So if you set up or incorporate in a tax in a, in a state that has zero uh, rate of tax, like uh, Delaware, uh, Florida, um, uh, or Nevada, but you're operating and you're deriving all your revenue or majority of your revenue from a high income tax state like California, then even though you're set up in a tax-free state, you're going to be paying tax uh, primarily in the state where it's sourced. Um, so when we are advising people on the state in which they should be setting up, uh, we're looking at it um, primarily based on which state has the best corporate legal regime because every single state in America has different laws regarding uh, the way they treat corporations. Um, uh, so we're, we're thinking about it, okay, which legal system is practically best for your type of business. Um, and in most cases, I mean, the, 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 the preeminent state um, in America is generally considered to be Delaware, and that is primarily be, because um, of the structure of its courts, courts of equity, uh, which mean that um, to, to the extent you have a situation where you need to uh, you need to litigate a matter or there's some form of dispute, um, it, it's better to do it in Delaware. So most clients that are coming to us are probably, in the, are probably incorporating their entity in, uh, in Delaware. That's the most common. And then they will set up in another state as a, as a out-of-state corporation um, through, through a formal registration process. So if and you need to do that in every state that you've got a physical presence. So if you were to come into the US and you had to, out of the gate, set up an office in California and uh, in Texas, you might incorporate in Delaware and then register as an out-of-state corporation in California and Texas. Great. Thanks, Peter. Um, well, if there's no other questions, we might leave it uh, there. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, and as I said, if anyone does think of any questions they'd like to ask, just feel free to get in touch with Peter or David or I. Um, and we're very happy to share a copy of the um, PowerPoint presentation with anyone who'd also like it. Thank you. Thank you.